and several times, uh, even during the fighting, my, my life was on the line, and by a quirk or the touch of God, I made it. I was in a truck and, and with a driver, with my friend Gerald Block. We were both in the cab of the truck, and we went down between the lines, carrying, but we're getting, we're retrieving a gun, a 155 gun, and 32 holes, bullet holes, came into that cab, and he and I, neither one of us, got a scratch. Now you can say what you want to about it, but that's, it's, it's just, a, it was a miracle. And I, I was ambushed, all, but anyway, um, they switched us around, and I want to tell you, but after we got to Japan, we organized and we did every sabotage we could do. We stole everything we could steal. In particular, if a guy came to, if a guy came to work with a, a, a bucket, I mean a box with his lunch in it, he better hide it good because if some POW would get it. And if he got caught, he got beat. But that's all right, he got something to eat. We ate worm, wormy rice 90% of the time, and, we complained about it every time, every day. And one day we got some white rice, didn't have worms in it, we would complain about that too. <laughs> they put us in, they put us in a graphite factory. And uh, we were making electrocarbon sticks for the one-man submarines. So it, it was in Kobe. We were in an industrial complex. And you go outside and count eight or nine big smokestacks, cross it, uh, there was a, Runway right in front of us, an assembly zero plane assembly plant right to the left of us. And every night we'd hear the B 29s coming closer and closer. We could hear the bombs dropping and the sirens and all that. And we knew that we had to get out of there. We was in that building and I had no no notice or any target or anything saying that there was any Americans in there. So I say God intervened again. That was, oh, let me tell you, we, we got there, they were putting out 300 a month. First month, we found out what the good ones were and what the bad ones were from the inspector. We put the good ones in the bad pile and the bad ones in the good pile. We cut them down 100 the first month, so next month another 100 about, and the 23rd of the next month, we only had three good ones out, and they were just about ready to kill us. Anyway, God intervened right there. The guy had an epileptic fit, and they said, what in the world is that? What's wrong with him? We said, it's a very highly contagious tropical disease. <laughs> well, that night we stayed up until, uh, they, they put him in a solitary confinement over there, in a room by himself. The next day we had 10 more to come, and they had 10 more in there, and the next day was about 20. And 10 days after that, we was out of there. So they moved us to a town called Suruga on the west coast of Japan, and we were unloading, what would you believe, soybeans, rice, and dried fish. It was like a POW uh, cafeteria, to tell you the truth. We was eating all the time. But if they caught you with something in your mouth, they'd knock it out of your mouth and try to knock your head off. They was rough on them. So you had to eat it and swallow it. If you had it in your mouth, he looked at you real close. Had to swallow it all and get rid of it, <laughs> but we didn't care. But we we thought we had the mainstream of the rice and and, and bean supply to the people. We we load a train of uh, a railroad car with 380 bags of beans or rice, and it would be stacked in there four high, and right in front of the door would be two two left right in front of the door. Well, this little Japanese would come there. Inspector, and he was sort of short. He'd look up there and he'd say, How many? We tell him 380 in Japanese. We learned that. And he'd say, Put it down in his book. He never got up there and looked. We go up there and room, make a circle around the door and put those two bags in front of the door. We may not have a 35 or 40 in that. <laughs> oh, he'd put a seal on it, and then what we'd have to do is break that seal for it left the yard. We never let a car get out of there without breaking that seal. So this made this look like that some Japanese down the road was stealing. Okay, well that was going fine for us for a while. And all of a sudden, the warehouse was still full and they're supposed to have shipped it all out. <laughs> so we, we got together and said we'll fight, we'll pick fights all up and down here. And three or four guys out there throwing the bags of beans and rice in the ocean. 
in the, in the water. And that worked for about three weeks. We were getting rid of a lot of that stuff. And we got close one morning and here we heard a real uh, commotion down there at the, at the docks. And when we got out there, there, there was a ship out there that couldn't even get up to the dock. And there was a, a, a bridge and, and it was all they had, all it had was bags of beans and bags of rice coming out. And they beat us, they beat us and did everything in the world but kill us. And uh, when our first, now the B-29s had burned us out twice then. And it was a total of three times. And, and the, uh, the day that was happy for us is, of course, we, we didn't think we were going to ever get home because they told us they were going to shoot all prisoners of war. But when the Navy dive bombers came and, and dive, hit that port that we was in, they, because they had burned us out, we didn't have but clothes on our back, so we talked to the Japanese into letting us wash our clothes with no soap and, sea, and salt water. But at least we'd have a day off. So there was 50 of us at a time washing our clothes. And this guy from the 200 Coast Artillery heard something and he ran outside and he looked up and he came back in. He said, they're coming down 11 o'clock. See, we said, what's coming down 11 o'clock? He said, I don't know, but something's coming down 11 o'clock. But we'd never seen any dive bombers yet. That was the first one that came. So in about three minutes after that, we was at the end of the warehouse. And here comes the rockets. Boom! Right, boy, man, is just fire and the balls of fire was flying every which way. And 50 of us went out of there naked, jumped over a pile of coal, and run up on a knoll that was up there like it was a football game. Man, we was hollering and screaming and going on. And the, and the Navy pilot saw us and he started doing like this, so it meant that he he saw us. I wondered, and I really would have liked to have known and talked to that guy when he, when he went back and reported. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, uh, but we did everything we could to slow them down. Now, I'm, I will ask all of you something. With all this that happened to us, would you have any hate for the Japanese? You know, I know a lot of Americans who weren't even in the war that had hate for them. Man, I hated them. My hate went back to where I had a fight in, in Manila before the war with a bunch of Japanese sailors. I mean, it just it kept growing and growing, and every day I could build a book of hate. And I hated them with a, a purple passion. And would you think if you'd been through all of that, that you would have hated them too? I see some of you nodding your head. Well, I'm going to tell you. I came back to a wonderful reunion, and I want to tell uh, the one thing that when I'm right, right here, right now, I put my dog tags, I had two sets of dog tags, I put one set of dog tags in a mass grave in Camp O'Donnell, and when the, the MacArthur came back, took the Philippines back, they dug them up, and they notified my family that I was dead. So for eight months, my family thought I was dead, except my daddy. And uh, tell you when I a little bit further I'm gonna pick that back up and get back and tell you what happened. But you know, I couldn't help but hate him. I wouldn't even let my wife drive a, a Jap car. He'd get Terry came home one night and said she's gonna buy a Toyota. And I said, You gonna do what? And he says, I'm gonna buy a Toyota. I said, Where you gonna park it? <laughs> I said, you ain't going to park it here. I told the, um, and I'd already started trying to, my preacher told me I had to get rid of the hatred. I had a burden of hatred. I was having nightmares for 30 years, and the nightmares were not getting better or easier. They were getting worse. I was getting, the way I'd get in a nightmare tonight, maybe two nights later, I'd get in the same nightmare and do the same thing over again. I had nightmares about nightmares. And my health was just going to pieces, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't keep anything on my stomach hardly sometimes, or my nerves and so forth. I was just a bottle of nothing, and I was fighting this hatred, and I knew I had to get rid of it. And so, she about that Toyota, she came home and said that, and she said uh, we we finally agreed to buy our Sabbath. Well, 
And one month that salad broke down. And every time it broke down, she said, see if I had my tie I would have it. <laughs> so, but it was hard for me. And I, had, I said, well, I'm going to have to get rid of it. And I went through all kinds of torment. It took me two and a half years to get rid of the hatred. And I woke up one morning, and it had been three and a half weeks that I had no nightmares. And I haven't had one since, not one of those. I had some good dreams. And God has blessed me with my health. I've had cancer. I had lung cancer, lost half my right lung. I've had about six bouts of cancer. I had prostate cancer. And uh, I just keep on going. I mean, it's like a little energized rabbit, you know. I guess I may have a, one of those rabbit uh, batteries up me or something. So but I just keep going. And you can do that, and you can help. When, I, when this happened to me and I realized I could, I could have friends, if, you, if I met you and you was a possible friend, I try to find out if you want to like the Japanese or not. And if you didn't hate the Japanese, I couldn't, I couldn't make friends with you. It was bad. I met a guy by the name of um, Sue Kosawagi man named Sue in Los Angeles. And I said, Sue, you and I are going to have a rough time. And I told him, I said, because I hate every Japanese in the world. And here you are, Japanese, and you want me to get along with you. And we, we, was, we was in sort of a, a business that sort of overlapped into each one of us. And he said, well, I got news for you, Glenn. I went to war for the United States, and I went to Europe wouldn't let me go to Japan. I hate them too. So we got along pretty good. <laughs> and um, let me tell you what happened on the, those dog tags. When MacArthur went back in and took the islands back, the Philippines back, they went into Camp O'Donnell and, uh, and dug up that grave. And they found my dog tags in there. Now they had sent my family missing in action when the, the Bataan fell. And, it, and I went to Japan early, so I didn't get on a Red Cross list or anything. Red Cross wasn't organized enough at the time. So they sent two and a half months, they, I mean two and a half years, they sent them another notice, assumed that because they haven't heard anything from me. When I put my dog tags in there, I didn't dream that I'd ever go to Japan. So I'm up in Japan, and um, so, so uh, uh, when I got back to Letterman General Hospital, I called home, and my daddy it was the only one out of my family that didn't think I was dead. He said, I think my son's alive, and he wouldn't accept a $10,000 settlement. So I called home, and my mother answered the phone, and my middle name is Dowling, and that's what they called me back home. And I, I, my mother answered the phone, I said, Mother? She said, Who is this? And I said, This is Dowling. <coughs> Home with dad. <laughs> so her sister, my aunt, one of my dear aunts, was there visiting that day. She picked up the phone and said, who is this? I told her, the phone went dead. <laughs> so I, I was saying, hello, hello, hello. And finally, my oldest sister came to the phone. And she said, who is this? And I told her, the phone went dead again. So I'm standing there hollering, hello, hello, hello. And my daddy picked up the phone. And he says, who is this? And I told him, and he says, I was the only one in this family that didn't believe you was dead. But he said, look like I've got three dead women here on the floor. <laughs> 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 he said, you just, you just hang on and I'm gonna go get a pitcher of water and pour it in the So he got, got, got a pitcher of water come in there and poured it over me. He said, they're, they're wiggling a little bit. I think they'll be all right. <laughs> but, um, that was, but I had a glorious time, and in, in the aftermath of that also, we was all sitting around the table, all of my siblings, and uh, except one, he was in Okinawa, and uh, that second night, and I said, let me ask you all something. When you got the word that I was dead, that guy came up here and tried to settle the insurance. How many of you fainted? They looked at each other, you know. No, nobody. I said, well, why did you, why did you faint? 
when he found out I was alive. And then I saw a rascal coming home. <laughs> well, let me tell you some funny things we did after we came back. We were, it was seven of us. It was uh, in one group. And we were sitting, uh, laying up on a bank by the hospital just left up of our pajamas home. And uh, here come the railroad in there, bringing in five railroad cars. And by the, about five minutes later, here comes a crew of about two trucks and all, and they got opened up the uh, cars and started unloading some of the stuff out. And it came with a whistle blew for 12 o'clock. We, we were watching them. So they, they shut the doors and took off. So one of the guys said, hmm, you know something? Why don't we move those cars around to the gate? Now the, the railroad is absolutely flat from where they were, from the, here up to back to the gate. And you, if they, in the Letterman General Hospital extension out there, you couldn't see from here, you couldn't see the gate. So we got out there and unhooked them and used the old technique we met with, had in Osaka, Japan, by getting, hey, you know, uh, you shot. Hey, you know, uh, you shot. You shot, you shot, you shot. Getting all to get them together, started moving them, and we moved all five of them all the way around to the gate. <laughs> so we were laying up there, and here they came back. And the sergeant says, hey, now somebody said, train come in here and got those cars, those cars. So they were waiting, and he said, pretty soon, the railroad said they didn't come back. So call security, okay? Security said to know the gates hadn't been unlocked. Well, I guess the five cars don't just disappear in the thin air. So we were sort of laughing and sort of getting the kick out of it. And a major came on the scene and he looked up there and he said, hey fellas, he walked up there and he said, how long have y'all been here? Pretty good while. He said, did you see anything happen? I said, yes. He said, well, did you see them? What happened to those cars, freight cars? So they're around there by the gate. And he said, well, one, how in the world did they get around that? We put them around that. He said, oh, uh huh. So he said, told the sergeant to go around that. The sergeant came call back, yeah, they're around here. So he said, you're smart. You, you, you guys are smart. So I'm going to make you bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to watch you. So we got around there and started to do, hey, no, go, you saw, you saw, you saw, and I started moving them. We moved four of them around, and he, he laughed, and he said, yeah, all right, boys. He said, help them get that fifth car around there. You help push it around there. It wasn't hard to do it when we do it, when we did it like the Japanese do it. And um, because, and he was astounded, and, and everything, he, and he, think, he said, you know, if you didn't agree on that, and we found out you did it, you would be in serious trouble. <laughs> and I know. So a lot of those cases are things. And I wanted to ask you all, and I'll tell you, um, hatred is one of the worst things in the world that a person can possess. I know I experienced it. It was so deep inside of me that I didn't even think for myself that I could even have a chance of getting rid of it. But I made up my mind and I did it. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you, one little bit of hate can grow like a, bull, like a bush. It gets bigger all the time. With me, it got the way my whole personality was based on it. I was abrupt, abrupt to people sometimes. I just, uh, and, and I really am a very humble person. But it ruined my life. 